scream for IP. I scream for IP. We all scream for IP. Hello there, everybody. Welcome to episode number 520 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. Brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. Are we talking about intellectual property today? Why, yes. Yes, we are. My guest is Manmeet Walia, and we are investigating the ASIC model for IP, the evolution of IP, and the biggest trends in IP today. So, without further ado, please welcome Manmeet to Fish Fry. Hi, Manmeet. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Amelia. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning to you. Okay, so first off, we're talking about IP and the complexity of designs today. So, Manmeet, from your perspective, how complex are designs getting these days? Yes, so I joined Synopsys in 2009, as back as about 25 years ago in 1996. The typical chips were around 7.5 million transistors, and I'm referring to Intel's Pentium. In 2022, approximately 27, 28 years later, Apple A16 is 15 billion transistors. So that's 2000x, you know, just to give you some perspective of how big these chips are getting. So at Synopsys, we talk about hitting the laws of physics or hitting the laws of semiconductor physics. And these laws of semiconductors are faltering now. Basically, we talk primarily about three laws. The Moore's law, which is the cost per millimeter square. The Moore's law talked about doubling the transistors every 18 months. But what is happening now is that that law is coming to an end and cost per millimeter square has been increasing since 40 nanometer days. The second one has to do with Denard scaling. And this is all about power density per millimeter square, which was supposed to stay constant as we double density every 18 months or two years, but that's no longer true. The power density per millimeter square is not staying constant. It's increasing, so we are running into all these thermal issues. And the third one is the Amdell's law, which is about increasing system performance by parallelizing the CPUs or with multi-threading. But even here, what is now happening is that the I.O. speed has not been keeping up with making all these CPUs run in parallel. And this is, again, causing bottlenecks in the systems because I.O. speeds are not doubling as frequently as you can increase the CPU speeds or parallelize them. So again, to summarize, we are beginning to hit the ceiling of physics, the semiconductor physics. There is a lot more pressure on power, performance area, latency, and cost. So overall scaling is getting more and more difficult. A lot of the customers, a lot of the SOCs that we are working on are now hitting the max reticle size limits. And even beyond the die, right? I mean, the packaging, the board, the system, the software, all of that is getting more and more complex. Absolutely. So how does IP fit in here? And how do you feel it's evolving? I will start with a statement from Gordon Moore, <laughs> Intel, and this is called the Day of Reckoning. He said, it may prove to be more economical to build large systems out of smaller functions, which are separately packaged or interconnected. And number one, this is exactly how IP will evolve, which is through multi-die systems, as we call them at Synopsys, also referred to as chiplets. So we will see that IPs for these multi-die systems will accelerate. We are expecting about a 5x growth in multi-die systems in the next five years. And IPs like UCIE will play, these are the newest IP titles and perhaps the most exciting IP titles for this day of reckoning that Gordon Moore had predicted. So what's happening precisely is that we see a lot faster evolution of protocols. You know, in the last 10 years or so, Ethernet has gone up from 10 gig to 100 gig, now moving towards 200 gig serial speeds. PCIe is, is also evolving very fast, doubling the speed every two to three years. 
So we have now PCIe 6 running at 64 gigabits per second PAM4 speeds. PCIe 7 has also been launched. PCIe 7 spec definition has started. And same is happening with memory interfaces and USB is now approaching 80 gig and so on. So what we see is that standards are accelerating faster to address this IO bandwidth gap. Historically, we had seen four to five years between revisions, but now that's accelerating to two years, two and a half years. And, and each one of these requires a new FI architecture. It requires porting into advanced FinFET nodes and a lot more customizations. So again, lots of excitement around multi-die systems, faster evolution of these protocols. A couple of other things. We see that every IP title, every interface IP title now needs to be secure. So security is becoming very important. Latency is getting very important. Low latency interfaces are getting extremely important. Our customers are asking for more and more customizations on the individual IP titles. They're asking for application-specific interface IP titles. A PCIe selling into a mobile device is going to be very different from PCIe selling into a high-end server. And finally, there is a lot of pressure to have these IPs battle-tested because these are extremely expensive SOC developments. So having them battle tested with multiple silicon proof points, you know, very thorough testing and just having them work flawlessly across PVTs is getting very, very critical. That makes sense. Now, let's talk about Synopsys. Now, you guys have been developing and delivering IP for decades, but what are you seeing customers asking for now that they weren't before? Yeah, so Synopsys has been the number one provider of interface IP titles. We are three to four times larger in terms of uh, how much IP we sell than our next competitor. We are selling, servicing several key markets. This includes the high-performance compute, the cloud, the AI, the automotive, all the hot markets. And what we see different now is that IPs are getting more application specific. The same IP title that I need to sell in automotive is going to be very different from an IP in the cloud or a hyperscale data center. There is expectation of maturity, and I used the word battle tested before. That is getting extremely important because these are multi year projects and extremely expensive projects. So our customers would do very thorough evals before buying, procuring the IP titles. Harsh evals, uh, more and more margins are required because think about this, these IPs will be getting deployed in harsh data center environments where hundreds of thousands of servers are running across PVTs, you know, with multiple lanes running, hundreds of lanes running together in an SOC, in a large SOC. So, So more maturity, more margins are required and harsh evals are required prior to procurement. There is expectation of IPs to come as complete solutions. So complete solutions, which are optimized to work as a full solution. Typically, every SOC would have three to four to five different interface IP titles. So our customers are expecting the full portfolio. As an example, high-performance compute SOCs would have a high-end PCI Express, a high-end Ethernet, die-to-die interfaces that I talked about, and memory interfaces. So approximately four or five interface IP titles, would a portfolio of four to five interface IP titles would be required. Besides that, as we're getting into automotive space, there is expectation of quality and functional safety. So IPs that we sell in automotive come with their own sets of requirements. And this is where Synopsys is taking a lot of initiatives around being ISO qualified, around having independent IP quality teams that oversee the development of IPs. We have independent internal and external auditors and assessors So all those requirements come as we get into a space like automotive. And finally, we have what we call as uh, IP accelerated initiatives, which is all about making sure that we can enable time to market and lower risk for our customers by putting ourselves in customers' shoes to make sure that they can integrate these products easily. Fantastic. Now, you just wrote a blog on how IP providers need to adopt the ASIC model. So for my audience who may not know, what exactly is the ASIC model? 
Yeah, so just to be very clear, Synopsys is not in the business of selling ASICs or chips, so that's an absolute no. But what I mean by the ASIC model is that IPs are now moving from being individual blocks to more complex integrated systems. And that's the transition we see from individual blocks to more complex systems. We are now building what we call as IP subsystems. And the idea here is to reduce the design risk by having pre-tested silicon proven IP subsystems for the SOCs that are configured to be customized for you know, specific applications and specific requirements, reducing the overall cost for our customers. Basically, it's a collaborative process. We are putting more system solution together, which frees our customers time so that they can spend their R&D resources on their own product differentiation. And the third aspect here is accelerating their time to market. So we provide IPs in a way that are customized to the full subsystem, which is delivered quicker than what it would take our customers to do that. And again, it frees their time to basically speed up the whole integration process and the overall time to market. When we talk about the ASIC model, it essentially means we can harden some blocks. We can provide signal integrity, power integrity type services. And overall, we can accelerate the IP integration into the customer SOC. This would include the subsystems that I just talked about. This would include hardening. This would include signal integrity, power integrity, helping them with the overall SOC architecture, with some of the PNR activities, with prototyping activities. And then even, you know, once they get the silicon back, we can help them with things like uh, silicon bring up to ensure that they can get to production quickly. So for the industry as a whole, how does the ASIC model help? Yeah, so industry is at a point where we see a shift in the equilibrium or shift in the ecosystem from traditional semiconductor vendors to more like uh, vertically integrated hyperscalers, as an example, right? So a lot of these vertically integrated OEMs and hyperscalers are at that juncture of picking between an ASIC model versus a COT model. COT stands for Customer Owned Tooling. ASIC has an advantage of basically being able to offload everything to an ASIC vendor where they would go and and do everything from RTL design to hardening to manufacturing and giving known good dyes. Versus the COT model is where these vertically integrated hyperscalers and OEMs would have to build their own semiconductor teams they would have to have their own EDA tools, their own IPs. So, so it's a significant upfront investment, but that allows them to have more control over their destinies and it allows them to truly integrate in a vertical manner. So we see that a lot of our customers now are at that juncture of deciding between the traditional ASIC model versus a COT model. And this is where an IP vendor can come in And if the customer decides to go COT, we can help them in many, many, many different ways that I just talked about in terms of providing them subsystems, providing them signal integrity, power integrity services, silicon bring up services, on and on and on. That would kind of provide this middle road between a traditional ASIC model and a COT model. So if they decide to go COT, we can make their entire process of integration and their whole journey towards getting to package parts easier. We can provide a lot of services along the ways to help them, uh, help them with time to market, lower risk, and lower overall cost. Excellent. All right. It is time for your off-the-cuff question. Medmate, I know you like to hike, so where is your favorite place to hike? Yeah, so, you know, I love to go on long hikes many hours, and I do it all across the Bay Area. There are over 100 hikes that are very interesting and exciting, all from the redwoods to the shores and uh, steep climbs. So I, I like to try new things over weekends all across the Bay Area. And, and once every three, four months, we would also go to Yosemite or, or something a few hours out. 
and I like to do hikes with friends. I like to do hikes on my own sometimes. And it's like pressing that reset button on my head. You know, after a tedious week at work, it's it's like just resetting myself to to take on the next week. <laughs> I love that. I find that to be true as well. I definitely think nature is the best reset one can have. Awesome. Well, Manmeet, this was excellent. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Amelia. Thank you so much. <laughs> hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D 1978. And if LinkedIn is more your thing, I completely understand. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts. And remember, if you'd like to further support this podcast, please leave me a review on Apple Podcasts. It really does help. Also, if you'd like any further information about this week's show, just head on over to eejournal.com and look for this week's fish frying page. Thank you everyone for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com or post a comment on our forums on eejournal. For the week of February 23rd, 2023, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried. <laughs> <laughs>